Welcome! In this video, we look at section 4.7, Iterated Functions and Chaos. In particular, in this video, we will focus on iterated function sequences. Iterated function sequences. Here's an example. This is the length of word function. So, number one, think of any positive number. Two, count how many letters it takes you to write your number in English. The number of letters is your new number. And then three, repeat step two until you get the same number twice in a row. For example, let's say we start with the number one. Well, let's see, one written out in English is O-N-E, so one goes to three because O-N-E has three letters. Five letters, so three goes to five. Five has four letters, so that goes to four. Oh, and look what happens here. 4 has 4 letters, so 4 actually just loops around to 4. And we have this funny situation. 1 maps to 3, 3 maps to 5, 5 maps to 4, and 4 maps to itself. We have this infinite repeating loop. In fact, this is what the arrow diagram looks like for a variety of numbers. Pause the video if you'd like and sort of <laughs> look, at this, uh, look at this diagram. It's kind of interesting what happens if I start with 11. 11 goes to 6, which maps onto 3, which then goes to 5, and then to 4, and then loops forever and ever. In fact, it looks like no matter what number I start with, eventually we end up with the 4 that just keeps repeating again and again and again. It's really kind of interesting, right, how, how it should end up with just 4 at the end. A variation on this might be the Scrabble score function. Instead of counting the number of letters in the word, what you actually do is you make the word for the number, but then you treat it as though it was a word in the game of Scrabble. And in the game Scrabble, different letters have different scores, different point values like you can see in the chart, and then you create the, uh, the Scrabble score for your word. Uh, for example, if you start with the number 21, and you use the table on top to figure out your Scrabble score, you get 15. And then let's take the number 15, write it out in words, F-I-F-T-E-E-N, and as a Scrabble word, that would give you 13 points. 13 would give you 11 points. 11 turns into 9. 9 turns into 4. Now, this isn't the uh, same function as before, so I don't get 4 again but the, the score for 4 would be 7. 7 turns into 8. <laughs> is, is this going anywhere? Yes, it, I promise it is. 8, look at this. 8 gives you a score of 9. So what's going to happen next? I already saw that 9 turns into 4. So we don't get a single number that loops on itself. We actually end up with a sequence of 4 different numbers. It goes 4, 7, 8, 9, 4, 7, 8, 9, 4, 7, 8, 9. We just sort of worked our way into this loop that keeps repeating forever and ever. Here's the arrow diagram for the Scrabble score function. So here's that loop, the 9, 4, 7, 8, 9, 4, 7, 8. Also, it's kind of interesting, 12. <laughs> There's the Scrabble score for the number 12 is just the number 12. When, it, when a number loops back on itself like that, we call it a fixed point under the function. So the function evaluated it at 12 gives you 12. The number 12 is fixed. Here's a good card trick that has to do with functions like this. So this trick uses all the aces, twos, threes, fours, and fives from a standard deck of cards. And you can uh, throw away all the other cards for now. You don't need them. So Here's what happens first. You take all those aces, twos, threes, fours, and fives, and you shuffle them together. Now, I'm the magician, and I tell you, you, what you need to do is, you pick a number from 1 to 5 and call it K. But don't tell me. I'm the magician, so you keep your number K secret. Don't tell me what it is. And then I'm going to start dealing the cards face up onto a single pile. When K cards have been dealt, the rank of the top card becomes your new key number K. For example, let's say you think to yourself uh, maybe the number three. That becomes that's your that's your K at the beginning, right? And you're just thinking it. You're not you're not actually telling me. Okay, so let's say for example that I'm the magician and I start dealing the cards out. And the first card I put down is a five, and then maybe an ace comes after that. 
and then a 2. Ah, so you, remember, you're thinking to yourself, K is 3. So when that third card has been dealt, that becomes your new key number. Okay, so then what happens? I continue dealing. After K more cards, find your new key number, K, and so on, until all the cards have been dealt. So continuing this example, maybe after that, there comes another 5, and then maybe an ace. But remember, when I hit the 2, that changed your key to become 2. And so you count 2 more, and now your ace is the next key. Well, right away, um, the next card that, that's dealt, that becomes your key. 4. And then 1, 2, 3. You know, 3 more cards are dealt. And then, I don't know, something else. You know, maybe a 3 appears. And so 3 becomes your key again. So this pattern will continue where I'm dealing out cards. And throughout the process, you are always updating what your number K is. As the magician, I will be able to tell you your last key number. How? So at the end of all this process, when all the cards have been dealt, I will look you square in the eye and I will say, your key number is 3 or 5 or 4 or whatever it is. But somehow, I will know what that key number is. And throughout this process, you're only thinking to yourself. You started thinking the K, and you didn't tell me anything, but you just followed the sequence through. So, how do I do this? Let's take a look. Here's an example card sequence, starting with 2, and then I deal the ace on top of that, and then the 3, and the 5, and so on. Suppose you start by thinking that K is, um, I don't know, 3. So when the third card comes up, that's your key card, that's your new key number, which actually ends up you know, remaining 3. And so you go 3 more cards, so 5 is dealt, 4 is dealt, and then 3 is dealt, and then 5 is dealt, ace is dealt, ace is dealt, that becomes your key. And then after that, we go to the 4, and then you're thinking, okay, I need to go 4 more, so 1, 2, 3, 4, Four, five is the next key card after that. that. One, two, three, four, five. And then that two at the end there. And so at this point, the cards run out. I'm done dealing. And so your final key value is two. And I would, and as the magician, I would have been able to tell you that your, your key value is two. <laughs> because something funny happens. Look, look what maybe would have happened if you had chosen k equals two. 2 instead. So k equals 2. Oh, but do you see that's an ace? Ace is the same as 1. So that would have put you on the 3 right there. So actually, choosing k equals 3 or k equals 2 ends up giving you the same value at the end, your final, uh, your final key number. What if you had started with maybe 5? Tell you what, I'll do this in a different color. 5. All right, let's see where you end up with this. So 5, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, looks like that takes you to the ace right there. At which point you've you know, jumped into one of your previous sequences. So it all continues from that point out. Do you remember at the very beginning I said that the key number you choose has to be somewhere between 1 and 5. So your key number two, three, four, will be one of these first five numbers. If you had chosen four, oh, look what happens. If you have, if you had chosen five as your key number, you'd end up with four, and look at that, four would map onto that ace right there. I think the only thing left is that two. What if your, what if your key had actually been one at the very beginning? If your key value had been one, then you find uh, the value is two. Two becomes your next key number. That goes to three, and at which point you've jumped onto the sequence. So no matter what number you start with from one to five, you're always going to end up at that 2 at the very end. Okay, so that's all well and good. It kind of shows you that no matter which number you pick from 1 to 5, you eventually end up at the same number at the end. But how do I, as the magician, know what that number actually is? And here's the trick. I actually play along 2. I always start with the very first number. I choose that as my key card. And I play the game along too. And I make the sequence as I go through. And I will eventually end up with a 2 at the very end. And in all likelihood, there is some probability here, in all likelihood, uh, I have ended up at the same number that you have. 
In fact, it turns out that uh, there's about a 95% chance of uh, success in this card game when these cards are shuffled up. It does, it's not 100%, but it's, it's pretty good, and you can probably play this a few times with a friend and impress them as though you were reading their mind. All right, so there we go. There's iterated function sequences in a card trick. Okay, let's make this idea a little bit more mathematical. Let f be a function on a set a, and let a sub 0 be an element of a. We define a1 as the function applied to a0. Then define a2 as the function applied to a1. And then a3 is the function applied to a2, and so on. This is an iterative process. I'm taking the output from one application of the function, and it becomes my new input for the function. The sequence a0, a1, a2, a3, on and on, is called the iterated function sequence for f starting at a0. Here's a mathematical example of an iterated function sequence. Let f be a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, and let it be defined this way. If n is even, let's take a look at the top, if n is even, then f of n is n over 2. And if n is odd, then f of n is n plus 3. How about a quick example? Let's start off with, I don't know, how about uh, 21? What number comes after 21 in the sequence? Well, 21 is odd, so I add 3. 24, 24 is even, so divide by 2. 12 is even, divide by 2. 6 is even, divide by 2. 3, uh, 3 is odd, so add 3. Oh, 6. 3, 6, 3. It looks like I've ended up in a loop that contains the two numbers, 6 and 3. Uh, let's try starting off with a, a different starting point. How about 30? So 30 is even, we'll divide by 2. 15. 15 is odd, so add 3. 18, which is even, divide by 2 to get 9. Um, I'll add 3. 12. Divide by 2. 6. Ah, look at that. I ended up in the same pattern again and again and again. Okay, here's something else. Th I promise, th this one will be a little bit different. <laughs> okay, how about 34? 34 is even, so the next number after that is 17, which is odd. So after that, I get 20, and then 10, and then 5, and then 8, 4, 2, 1. Oh, what, now what happens? 1 is odd, so I add 3 to get 4, and now look at this. This 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1 loop ends up. So it looks like we have two different loops. We have a 6, 3, 6, 3 loop and a 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1 loop. Are there other loops? Are there any fixed points? These might be some questions that we ask uh, when we're working with an iterated function sequence. What are the loops? You know, maybe there don't even have to be any loops. Conceivably, you, we, we could have a sequence of numbers that actually grows larger and larger and larger without bound, and it never ends up looping. Well, let's see what happens for this particular sequence. Here are the uh, sequences that uh, result, starting with the numbers 1 through 9. And if I start with the numbers 1 or 2, I end up with a 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1 sequence. And if I start with number 3, then it ends up 3, 6, 3, 6 repeated. And those are the only two kinds of loops I seem to end up with. So here's a question. Will it always end up looping like this? And could we prove it? Yes, we can prove it. In fact, let's do that on the next slide. Proof. Let p of k be the statement, the iterated function sequence starting with k ends with loop 1, 4, 2, or 3, 6. Now the base case we actually have nine of these base cases. We've already verified p1 through p9. So for all of those starting numbers, yes, they end up with a loop of either 1, 4, 2, or 3, 6. Well, let's assume, this is for induction. We'll do an induction proof. Let's assume that p1 through pm minus 1 have all been proven. Now, this is actually an example of strong induction. I'm not just assuming that p sub m minus 1 is true. I'm actually assuming all of those are true. Okay, that's fair enough. We can do that. Um, let's prove the next one. And incidentally, I guess we can say m is greater than 9 since we've already proven 
uh, 1 through 9. We have a couple cases. What if m is even? If m is even, then the iterated function sequence begins m, and then m over 2 right away. Ah, but look at that. m over 2 is much less, right? m over 2 is less than m. m over 2 is less than m. And since p of m over 2 has already been proven, this proves p of m. For example, if I start with the number 10 in my sequence, what's the next number that's going to happen after 10? It's going to be 5. Oh, but 5, I know exactly how that ends up. Well, at least I know it ends up in either a 1, 4, 2, or a 3, 6. So once I drop down into a lower number, then I know uh, that the, the statement of the theorem will be true. All right, so that was the first case. M is even. Now let's tackle what if M is odd. If m is odd, the iterated function sequence begins m, and then m plus 3, which gets larger, but then it goes m plus 3 over 2. So maybe there's a chance that m plus 3 over 2 dips below my original m. If it does, that would be great, because then I would know that uh, one of my earlier cases uh, verifies this. Is m plus 3 over 2 actually less than m? M, m plus 3 over 2 is less than m if and only if, let's say I'll multiply both sides by 2, m plus 3 is less than 2m. Okay, let's uh, subtract m from both sides, and I get 3 is less than m. Oh, but you know, in fact, I know that m is greater than 9, so certainly m is greater than 3, and so yes, yes, I really do have that m plus 3 over 2 is less than m. Thus, a p of m plus 3 over 2, and so that tells me that p of m as well. Eh, there's the proof. Here's another example. This, uh, this is a famous example, and this has a name, the Collatz problem. Let g be a function from the naturals to the naturals, defined by uh, this function. So in, in a very similar way to the previous. If n is even, I divide by 2. If n is odd, I multiply by 3 and add 1. Right? So if it's even, we divide by 2. If it's odd, multiply by 3 and add 1. Uh, pause the video if you'd like and actually confirm the arrow diagram that you see here. It is sort of interesting. Let's say we start at 9. Uh, multiply by 3, add 1, 28. Okay, divide by 2, divide by 2. Oh, we get odd. Uh, multiply by 3 and add 1. And so we go on. And these numbers actually, they, they kind of bounce up. They bounce down a little bit. I go as high as 52. But then eventually it goes uh, 20, 10, and then the sequence loops 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. If I had started with the number 12, we can see that at some point it hooks onto the sequence right at 10. And so starting at 12 will give me that 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1 uh, loop at the end also. It is conjectured that given any starting number, the sequence eventually reaches 1 and consequently loops after that, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. Key word here, conjectured. This is an open problem. Nobody knows the answer to this problem. <laughs> and isn't that funny, right? Because the previous problem, the proof was pretty straightforward. But um, for this problem, nobody knows. They think it's true. I mean, there's been extensive study, uh, but nobody has ever actually found a counterexample to this. There are some things that could happen with this sequence. It, conceivably, the numbers could, we, we could find a starting number where uh, the sequence grows larger and larger and larger and just never comes down. Or potentially, we could find some loop that's higher up in, uh, in some really large numbers, but uh, no one has found any of that yet. Here are just a, a couple quick examples. If you start with the number 13, eventually you see you end at 1. If you start with 71, look at what a long path this takes. It bounces up, it bounces down, up and down, up and down. Uh, it reaches a maximum value of 9,232, and then eventually comes back down again, and it does reach 1 at the very end. On the other hand, sometimes I can start with a really big number, and it's a fairly short sequence that eventually hits 1. Here's a website that has some nice uh, calculations uh, on the Colatz problem. All right, so on, uh, on this web page, it asks the number to test. 
and we uh, let's type in 123. Oh, this is also called the 3n plus 1 conjecture. I'll hit calculate there, and it does a little calculation. It's kind of neat. You can see it on the left. It, it shows you sort of how uh, how the number bounces around. It goes up and up and down and how long it takes. Uh, it gets to over 600, and we can see the, the list of numbers that's actually produced there. But then it eventually reaches 1, and it took 47 steps to get there. I was playing around with this a little bit earlier, and it looked like starting with 83 gives a pretty long sequence. Let's see here. 83. So, yeah, so that's quite, it seems to be uh, quite a long time. It starts off at 83, but then gets so huge, over uh, 8,000. Um, anyway, there we go, very quickly. There's the sequence. You can take a look. But eventually, yes, it does end at 1. So this is kind of an interesting website to play around with. Uh, I encourage you to uh, spend a little time and play with it and uh, see how this Colatz conjecture works. Also, they have a nice feature for the custom conjecture, so you can uh, create your own rules similar to uh, what we had on the previous problem. And I will end with this message. Uh, the caption here says, the Colatz conjecture states that if you pick a number, and if it's even, divide it by two, and if it's odd, multiply it by three and add one, and you repeat this procedure long enough, eventually your friends will stop calling to see if you want to hang out. Yes, this this problem, this Colatz conjecture, uh, is, is known as one of the greatest time sucks in mathematics. <laughs> so many people have thought, this looks like an easy problem. I'll try it, and you can just end up spending hours and hours on it, and finding a lot, and truly finding interesting patterns, uh, but making very little progress. Especially for those of you who are in computer science, right? It's easy to uh, make a little program and and uh, test a bunch of conjectures, but uh, maybe maybe I, I end with a warning: don't take too much time on this, uh, because it uh, I don't know whatever. It's it's a lot of fun. Play play around with it a little bit and, and see what kind of patterns you can find. And with that, I will end this video.